Um, <laughs> I'm an assistant professor at University of Nebraska Lincoln in the stats department, and today I'm going to talk about uh, pandemics and graphics and um, how we perceive log scale data. Um, so, and I should mention at the outset that this is joint work with my student, Emily Robinson, and um, a fellow professor at UNL, uh, Rekha Howard. Um, so that everybody is uh, acknowledged and I'm totally talking about Emily's work um, because it's awesome. <laughs> so, all right, so with that, uh, I'm gonna start out because I find it fascinating um showing you some past pandemic graphs um so historical graphs of uh pandemics gone by um that i spent a lot of time looking at last march um mostly because they made me feel a little bit better about the fact that humanity's seen this kind of thing before and we'll see it again and we got through it even if you know not everybody got through it at least humanity as a whole did um <laughs> But we, we could actually learn a lot from these graphs. Um, so, and then I'll talk a little bit about some early COVID graphs uh, from, you know, March and April and May of last year. Um, and then kind of what we tended to settle in on in terms of uh, news organizations and like reporting um, COVID case counts and things like that. And then once we get through all of that, I'm going to talk a little bit about some research that we've been doing on perception and log scales. Um, and this is research that's still underway. Um, actually, Emily, uh, the student that's working on this, uh, just did her prelim uh, today <laughs> and passed with flying colors. So uh, this is work that's very much still underway, but I, it's exciting and I really hope that you find it as fascinating as I do. Um, so, here are some of my favorite uh, past pandemic graphs. Um, the first one I'm going to show you, this is the uh, influenza and pneumonia um, admissions at Camp Bunston, um, which um, is just southwest of Manhattan, Kansas. Um, Kansas is kind of believed to be one of the uh, most likely origins of the 1918 flu. Um, and so you can see the first wave <laughs> hit and they just kind of extend the scale upwards um, <laughs> in this uh, graph and just kind of acknowledge, okay, yeah, this went completely off of the scale that we had going before. Um, and I find that kind of fascinating um, because in most contexts, you don't see graphs that just kind of violate the scale or extend the scale like this. Um, so it was something that I saw for the first time when I was looking at uh, these old graphics. And you see it a lot more. Um, so this one is looking at the temperature and mortality in London. And I believe it's specifically looking at um, just so excess mortality versus um, like times where there's less death expected than normal. Um, and so this is 1840 to 50, which um, is prime cholera uh, time. Uh, so cholera was pretty endemic at this point. And you can see that there are these massive outbreaks where the there are just a ton of excess deaths. Um, I'm not really convinced that this has any relationship to the temperature, to be quite honest. Um, but it's a really cool graph nonetheless, just to see the, um, they thought maybe things were seasonal. <laughs> um, and um, I, I'm not really seeing a lot of evidence for that in, uh, in these charts, but it's still really interesting to see how the just, massive epidemics show up on these kind of plots. Um, so the um, next graph I'm going to show you is, uh, so this is back to 1918 influenza. And here we see that 
these are all cause death. So they're not attempting to attribute death to any particular illness, but they've normalized things as an annual rate per thousand people. Um, and this allows us to effectively compare New York, London, Paris, and Berlin, um, though Berlin has some missing data um, because, you know, other things were going on in Berlin in 1918 and 1919, as it turns out. Um, but, um, so you can see these kind of blank areas that they just kind of, I guess, drew in um, to match the rest of the graph. But there's these peaks and it lets you see that um, London got hit a little later and then had a second wave that nobody else seems to have had, um, which is a really kind of interesting comparison. Um, the final chart that I wanted to show you is uh, plagues of London. And so this again, uses the circular plot that I'm not super fond of, but um, this compares the cholera years in 1849 and um, to plague years. So going back to the bubonic plague and saying, eh, cholera is not that bad. <laughs> Um, I think is the basic message of this chart. Um, so you can see the waves of the Black Death uh, go through London and just how outside the chart range things got for those uh, particularly traumatic um, waves of disease. So thinking about these graphs and then thinking about COVID graphs, uh, one of the biggest problems that it seemed like we faced early on in the pandemic is that the scales that we started with weren't really sufficient for the magnitude of the problem. Um, and so this is obviously a very common problem, right? When dealing with epidemic disease um, and something that is a historical um, trend as much as it is something that we were dealing with in this pandemic. Um, so I don't know, I found it very interesting to look back and say, oh, hey, they had the same problems, but probably worse because our software draws everything for us and it's no big deal to um, just redraw the entire graph. But in some of these, you're carefully rendering things by hand and that seems like it would, uh, really mess up your life if you had to completely redraw things just because you needed a new y-axis. So now we get to the fun graphics of COVID. Um, so early on in the pandemic, it seemed like there were just a ton of crazy graphics. Um, so Gwen and I actually talked um, a few, I don't know, like a month ago or so. Um, and I found out that this is actually called a uh, tornado plot um, and is a style of plot that has existed. I thought at the time that this was just a new thing and was like, okay, that's uh, an interesting take on life. Um, but evidently tornado plots are a thing. Um, <laughs> and the goal here is to show the uh, slowdown in COVID-19 deaths. Um, so you see a kind of a spiral effect as the deaths per day increase or decrease and the average number of deaths per day um, change as well. So that was one unique graphical form that uh, I was surprised by. I had never seen before um, either with or without COVID. Um, but this, this trend to show things that double back on themselves, which is relatively unusual, I think, in statistical graphs, right, um, in most cases, showed up quite a few times, really. Um, and so this chart shows the active cases versus total deaths, and this was something I found on Reddit. Um, and obviously the inset chart showing that the US is just completely outside of the rest of the world's graph um, early on in the pandemic. Uh, so this is from May 9th um, when things had gotten thoroughly out of control in the US. 
Um, but it, the directionality does at least give you an indication of, okay, things are maybe under control or maybe not, or maybe getting back out of control after having been under control, which is an interesting uh, facet of uh, graphs that I don't know that we usually uh, get that directionality um, out of other types of graphs. So a third one that I like is from our world and data. And it too shows daily new confirmed cases versus daily tests. And does this doubling back and are we making progress or not uh, sort of thing where Italy has falling cases, but their tests are increasing um, as of course, test availability became um, higher. And so um, it, it's a very interesting look at how things go, but um, I don't know, for the most part, it seems like when I think of statistical graphs, you think, okay, there's a trend line, but it, it doesn't double back on itself. Um, and so all of these were kind of interesting to me in terms of what we were plotting and how we were plotting it um, and the forms that showed up that were a little bit unique, um, it seemed like to me. Um, the last one that I'm gonna show you is one of my favorites actually, in that it seems to indicate an actual like pace of the pandemic. Um, and I mentioned um, the last time I gave this talk that some, some people actually did sonify this chart. And so you could hear beeps for each peak over time. And so you could actually get a visceral sense of the sound and the pace of the pandemic. So this chart does not bother showing any of the intermediate numbers. It's how many days does it take to get to a multiple of 500 deaths? Um, and so we've got approximately 14 days, then five days, then three days. And you can see the you know, pace accelerating. And I'll note that this is from like the end of March, 2020, because that's kind of important when you're uh, interpreting these things. Um, so Italy's obviously picks up very fast. Spain is similarly um, dealing with that. But the nice thing is this gives you the pace of the pandemic in a country no matter when they started their first case. Um, so it, it's independent of when the virus actually got to the country. Um, and I, I just think it's a very, it, it definitely takes away some of the extra information, but it simplifies things down to a, um, a reasonable sense of how bad are things now um, at the time of the graphic generation. And so I kind of find that fascinating. Um, so those, those are my, uh, novel graphical forms that I thought were particularly fun. Um, and I was kind of actively collecting charts at this point um, in an attempt to uh, focus on things that I could control. Um, <laughs> but uh, XKCD memorialized this period in history with this uh, comic that's, um, some of these COVID graphs are less than helpful, even if they are interesting. Um, <laughs> and I, I think I concur with that, um, that some of these things are not particularly easy to read um, and get information off of, even if they are interesting. And I'll pardon the uh, comments from the uh, peanut gallery on my end. Um, <laughs> my dog uh, is apparently uh, freaking out that somebody might have left the house. Um, <laughs> Oh no. So um, another thing that I'd like to bring up though is that there were other forms of visualization that weren't charts as we would normally think of them. And I think the New York Times front page from May 24th, 2020 is absolutely amazing. Um, if you've read uh, data feminism, I think they would call this uh, data visceralization rather than data visualization. 
in that you can definitely see the pace of the pandemic pick up as you scroll through. Um, and obviously there's a huge undercounting in through here um, as well, because we couldn't identify COVID at the time, even if we had wanted to. But the fact that they have little vignettes about some of the individuals that have died of COVID um, throughout this just really hits you like a gut punch. And I cried like a baby the first time I read through this page. Um, and, you know, the second and the third, um, <laughs> because it's very, very effective at making you feel the total loss um, and not just the raw count of people, but the lives and the um, effects that these people had on their communities um, and how much we lost as a result of this disease. And so just scrolling through the whole thing and you know, the figures get a little smaller and more dense as you go through. And I was kind of expecting that they might do a similar thing um, when we hit other milestones. So this was for hitting 100,000 deaths to COVID. Um, and they didn't. Um, and I'm wondering if maybe it was just a lot of work to assemble all of the obituaries for everything uh, that contributed to this page. But um, I think this is an important one to mention in terms of not everything was a chart, um, but there were some really interesting forms of um, data visualization that came out as a result of this. So what did we settle on? And it seems like, so uh, New York Times will not let me link iframes into my slides. It's very obnoxious. So I've decided just to stick with Financial Times because I can actually link the iframes in. <laughs> um, but it seems like for the most part, we've settled on some interactive graphics that allow you to switch out population-based versus raw numbers and linear scale versus log scale, right? And that's a pretty common way to do it. Um, so you can get information from mouse overs and things like that. Uh, the, it's a real shame that the New York Times won't let me link stuff because for the longest time, they had some really great visualizations um, that they've, I think, mostly taken down now um, or changed. But um, I, I do like very much the uh, just straight up presentation of this and the ability to switch between linear and log scale. And I think that's important for reasons that I will discuss throughout the rest of the talk. Um, the uh, linear scale is a lot more interpretable and easier for um, some people to read, right? But the logarithmic scale means that it's a lot easier to make comparisons between say India and the United States when the magnitude of what's going on might be very, very different, right? Um, so even at the height of the uh, Indian uh, wave that happened earlier this year, um, so they had like 30 average cases per 100,000 and we had 14. So we were at what, half the rate? But it was big news over there and um, kind of had faded out of the news here. Um, and I think that's kind of an interesting thing to note. Um, so a lot of other news outlets use maps to show either normalized cases or um, you know various computed metrics. Um, usually though, they did normalize by population, which helps a little bit. Um, but there were these challenges, right? Because you'd pick a color scale at the beginning and then, you know, that color scale would have a boundary at the top. And then cases would grow and that boundary was no longer relevant. And it became harder and harder, I think, for people who were trying to do this thoughtfully to 
figure out how to change the color scheme in a way that indicated, no, this is not the same as it was two weeks ago. This same shade of red actually means something much, much worse. Um, and it occurs to me that that conundrum is largely a result of the fact that uh, you can't go off the scale very easily with colors. Um, so, and I say this, but Iowa tried um, for a while there, they weren't updating their dashboard very well. And so any county that had a case count that was greater than whatever per capita just went white <laughs> um, and didn't show up on their maps at all, which was great. And, uh, you know, maybe an effective way of doing things right up until, you know, a lot of the state was just not there at all. Um, at which point they updated the dashboard and made the color scheme less effective. Um, <laughs> made it look like things were much more reasonable. Um, so I know that the New York Times, while I was watching their page, changed what the color scale meant, like in terms of what variable was being mapped to it, about four or five times during the course of uh, like April to July of 2020. Um, but they kept the actual colors that they were using the same. So it was really hard to tell on any given day what they were showing. Um, so it's, it's just an interesting um, set of what did we settle on. Um, I'm um, going to go with the Twitter version for um, this one, which I thought was kind of interesting. This B1617.2 is what we now call Delta. Um, and you can see that the uh, graphs here, this is Financial Times again, um, but did actually employ the, we're just gonna go off the scale uh, tactic. Um, so, um, you know, the ability to track different genetic variants of the virus is definitely something that didn't exist in 1918 but uh, we've resorted to the same graphical tactics um, that they did. And so I find that kind of uh, interesting uh, to see that same tactic repeated in the present day. So as I'm you know, trying not to panic in 2020 um, and now in 2021, um, <laughs> as I watch case counts grow, um, I started looking for papers to say, what do we know about how people perceive block scale data? What do we know about how per people perceive exponential growth? Um, and there's some, some research on the perception of exponential growth. There's a little bit of research on the perception of log scales, but not a whole lot. Um, and in fact, it took me uh, teaching a graduate class um, last fall to find a single paper that actually tested the utility of log scales um, in a way that had any sort of impact on like, or could be generalized in any way to COVID graphics. Um, so thank God for students that uh, are happy to send papers from their disciplines because I don't read nature, ecology and evolution very often. Um, <laughs> and uh, the problem with graphics papers is that sometimes they show up in odd places. Um, so what we know is that log scales may lead to some misinterpretation of what trends are in data, that people are generally terrible at forecasting any sort of exponential growth. We systematically underpredict exponential growth. And increasing the number of points on a chart helps with the perception of linear growth. But it doesn't actually help that much with the perception of asymptotic or exponential growth. And so adding more points or having a better resolution to your graph doesn't actually help, apparently, with exponential growth that much. Um, and so that's the, those are the, that's the full summary of the papers that I could find um, when I was looking into this. Um, and so I kind of was thinking to myself, OK, well, I guess this is kind of like um, certain rules on the internet where if you can't find something, you're obliged to uh, create it yourself. So I guess I have to now 
do an experimental study and write a paper on what we know about exponential growth in log scales. Um, it's kind of a moral obligation to fill that hole, right? Um, so there, there were all sorts of graphical guidelines going around um, during like March and April and May of 2020. And from what I could find, there was very little actual experimental evidence to back any of the suggestions up. So I started designing um, studies. And so the first question I had is, okay, can we perceive differences in exponential growth rates on a log scale and on a linear scale? Can we even notice that there is a difference? The second question I had was, okay, can we predict or forecast things accurately for exponential growth using log and linear scales? Um, ended up testing both exponential and linear growth because you've got to set a baseline somewhere, but um, I'm for the purposes of COVID related things, I'm primarily interested in, can we actually predict exponential growth well? And I'm, I'm this is important, right? Because if we can't predict ex and forecast exponential growth well, then that starts to explain why people weren't starting to panic that much um, when case counts started growing, right? I'm, I'm desperately seeking some sort of actual um, explanation for why people were behaving in what seemed to be a thoroughly irrational manner. Um, not that I think I'm actually gonna find it with this study, but I'm trying <laughs> to make the world make sense. And the third question that I had is, okay, can people actually use graphs with exponential data and draw conclusions about what's happening? And for this, I'm talking like numerical judgments. Can you read the data off the graph and do things with it in a way that leads to an accurate conclusion? And so this is three very different ways of engaging with the data, right? So the first question tackles a perceptual question. The second question, I've kind of thought of it as tactile, like can you physically like predict, but you don't actually have to understand what those numbers mean. You just have to interact with the data and manipulate it um, in a physical way. And then in an intellectual um, capacity, can you actually work with the data and use it to make accurate decisions and have to make quantities accurately. So um, I, I set these questions up and then made a decision that I'm holding to um, to this day, not to use any sort of COVID data to do any of the studies that we're gonna use for this. It's, it, in 2020, it was that it was too emotional and too scary and all of that. In 2021, it's, I think we don't have enough distance from it still. And then of course, as the Delta variant comes back around and we um, repeat 2020, um, I expect that it will get emotional and scary yet again. Um, so I am staying the hell away from any sort of COVID data. Um, <laughs> as we do these tests. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, each of these in turn. And I'd like to invite you, um, if you're interested, to take a couple minutes and work through this study uh, if you want to. So it'll give you an idea of what's um, going on. There's a short informed consent. Um, you might be able to actually get some insight into the tactics that we're using, but then I can actually talk about it as well. Um, so if you want to take a couple minutes and go through that, uh, now would be a good time before I ruin the study for you and the premise of the study. <laughs> so, while you uh, pull that up or not, because you are entirely welcome to uh, not participate as well, um, I'm going to stop for a drink and uh, let you work. What we set up was a factorial. Okay. So let's talk a bit about the experimental design. What we set up was a factorial experiment. Um, so there were two levels, log and linear scale. And then in each set of 20 plots, which is called the lineup, um, the single target plot could have either high, medium, or low curvature. And the 19 distractor plots or null plots 
um, could have either high, medium, or low curvature. And then we excluded any combinations where the target and null plot were the same. Um, and then we had either low or high variability around the uh, line. So when I said we excluded any combinations where the target and null were the same, that's not strictly speaking completely true. Each person got one plot where the target and the null plot had the same level of curvature. And that's used for estimation of um, some parameters in the modeling of the lineups um, that we haven't analyzed yet at all. Um, <laughs> so you, you did one extra um, evaluation to let me uh, contribute a little bit to the uh, lineup literature um, once we finish analyzing the interesting parts of log and linear scale. And so before today, at least 58 participants had completed 518 lineup evaluations. We removed 17 participants who didn't complete more than six evaluations. Um, you know, some people had some false starts and things like that, um, taking the uh, participating in the study. And so the goal here is to um, really be able to tell what we can and can't distinguish um, on log and linear scales. To pull this off, we had to uh, do a little bit of manipulation. Um, lineups require a lot of control over what the plots look like. And so we had to do things like ensure that the range was similar for each level of curvature, which as you can imagine, if your exponential parameter is growing really fast, the range isn't going to be the same. <laughs> um, so we had to add a multiplicative parameter on the outside and an intercept that messes a little bit with the uh, pure exponential curve. So we manipulated alpha and theta to ensure that the range and the domain constraints were met so that the curvature is the only major Q in a lineup. Um, and so here's the uh, canonical examples from this experiment. This is on a linear scale. And um, it, it's pretty hard to tell what the interesting plot is, right? But on the log scale, so the same data, it's very easy to pick out, OK, one of these things is definitely not quite shaped like the other. Right, and this is mostly what we're testing in this experiment um, is can we pick out these small differences in curvature easily? And the answer to that question, um, when we fit a linear model to assess all of the data, is that for one thing, it turns out it's easier to spot a curve among a bunch of straight lines than it is to spot a straight line among a bunch of curves. Um, which is something that I hadn't really thought too much about before, uh, but makes some sense. Um, lock scales tend to make us more sensitive to slight changes in curvature, um, except for this one bit of it's easier to spot a curve among a bunch of lines than it is to spot a line about, among a bunch of curves. So right here, this is the, the problem child, right? Where we have a, um, the target plot is a straight line and the null plots are very curved, right? And we can spot that easily, but otherwise um, it's a lot easier to pick out things when we're on the um, log scale. Right. All right, so that was the first experiment. And what we established is for the most part, we can perceive differences on log scales and um, that that part isn't as much of a concern. The next question is, can we predict or forecast exponential trends? And so there's a second study here. I'm running really low on time somehow. Um, <laughs> so, um, 
you are more than welcome to participate in this, but, um, and I will copy the link into the chat myself um, so that Sam doesn't have to type it out for me. But um, if the GIFs in the study don't load for you initially, just hit refresh. I can't for the life of me figure out why that's happening. But um, while, while you're participating in that, if you want, I'm going to talk a little bit about hand-drawn regression studies because I find them kind of interesting. So um, there's been a couple of studies out there that have looked at how good are people at drawing regression lines rather than fitting them by least squares or the like. Um, these studies started back in the 50s and the goal of this study was to determine how many iterations are necessary of a computer algorithm to get to the point where it's about equivalent to people drawing lines on paper by hand. So computers took a long time to uh, execute back then. Um, and what they found is that one iteration of the computer is sufficient to match um, the lines drawn by hand uh, to be at least that accurate. Uh, this study is great though. There is a ton of snark in the responses that people sent back with their um, parallel probit lines drawn on their assay. Um, so, so for like completely unbridled scientist snark, this paper is great. Um, another study was done in the 80s and found had graduate students in uh, intro biostatistics uh, fit linear regressions to four sets of points. Uh, they used a, just transparency with a straight line across the middle and had to mark the intersection of the uh, line on the paper. So they were, they were forced to draw a straight line. Um, and what they found is that instead of fitting the ordinary least squares regression line, students tended to fit the slope of the first principal component. And they suggest this, but there's not a lot of power to determine that because as you probably can expect, the uh, ordinary least squares line and the first principal component are pretty similar. Um, so we decided to replicate the eye fitting straight line study using a tool from the New York Times called you draw it. And so you can predict, right, draw your line through these things. So how does family income predict children's college chances? All right. And so they'll, I'm, I'm not even thinking through this exactly. Um, but once you say you're done, um, they'll show you the real line. And um, yeah, you can tell I'm not actually thinking through it. Um, I'm just doodling on their thing. But we used a tool. Well, OK, we, we actually lifted the JavaScript code from this um, and modified it for our purposes uh, to allow us to have people draw on charts where we're showing data. And so we have an experiment that does two things. First is to replicate the iFitting straight lines paper using the UDraw tool. Um, and we didn't require that people make straight lines because the tool doesn't require that. Um, but then the second goal is to explore exponential growth predictions on log and linear scales by using the same sort of um, draw the points after I show you part of a line. Um, and so I'm not going to talk about goal one right now. Um, suffice it to say, we did actually manage to replicate the results of that paper. And we actually had enough power to show that that first principle, principle component thing actually what is true in practice for the most part. Um, but I want to show you the uh, exponential growth predictions because I think they're really interesting. So this is just showing what the participants drew for each line. So for low curvature um, on the top, for high curvature on the bottom, and then 
in some graphs, we ended the points at 50% of the plot. And in some graphs, we ended the points at 75% of the plot um, domain. And you can really see when the curvature is high that the log scale predictions tend to be well above the linear scale predictions. Um, there's a distinct separation there just in looking at the straight up lines people drew. Now, if we look at the residuals from the points that were there, like if you fit an actual exponential curve to that and then compare that to the line that people drew, you can actually see much clearer that the linear stuff is being systematically underpredicted, right? So we validated the fact that on a linear scale, there's a systematic underprediction. On a log scale, there's quite a spread of predictions, but there are at least predictions above and below the line. <laughs> um, so we're not necessarily seeing the same like really huge systematic bias. Um, and so we're in the process of analyzing this data to you know, actually show something other than the basic raw data on a plot. But um, I think it's pretty safe to say that um, log scales actually result in an improvement in our ability to predict from uh, observed data to what the future will hold. Now, that said, that doesn't mean that anybody can actually interpret what those predictions mean, right? This is a physical manipulation. It's not saying that, oh yeah, I can totally project that, you know, 50% of my county is gonna have COVID by next week, right? Um, so there's no numerical meaning attached to these predictions. And that's what we designed the third study to cover. And this is the one that we haven't exactly executed yet um, because it turns out that it's very tricky to ask questions on numerical estimation and have them be robust and generalizable. So it's a lot harder to set this experiment up because phrasing matters and data matters. And I'll show you um, why this is, but if you think back to those lineups that we did in the first study, um, one of the best parts about lineups for me is that it completely sidesteps any sort of question of phrasing by encoding everything that you wanna know about the chart in the actual graph itself, right? There's no context there. It boils everything down to just a visual question of, can you identify this or not? And um, that's great for a lot of different, questions about visualization. It's a wonderful method. But um, if you look back at the history of graphical testing, um, we've known that pie charts, for instance, suck for a very long time. Hadley Wickham had a paper at one point translated that was like written in French originally, I think, and it was from like 1900 talking about how pie charts suck. Um, there were a series of studies going back and forth. Yes, they suck. No, they don't. Um, that boiled down to what questions people asked about the pie charts and what type of data they used. Um, so the configuration of the chart itself. And so if you ask somebody to estimate a percentage of a pie slice, you get different conclusions that if you ask somebody to make a judgment between two pieces of the pie, right? And so figuring out how to frame these questions is really hard, is what we've discovered. So right now, what we're considering is something like this, where we show the um, data over time and give an explanation, a little blurb about the plot. So this plot shows the amount of computer memory that could be obtained for a dollar between 1980 and 2020. Um, and if you know anything about the history of computers, that price dropped dramatically. Um, so you could buy a lot more memory um, for a given dollar amount. And then we have a similar blurb for the log scale version of the chart. So 
showing how to read the log scale. Um, and then we'd ask questions. What I'm planning, at least, is that we'll ask questions. How much memory could you purchase with $100 in 2020? So that's directly read something off the graph, right? And then the, the plan, I think, is to ask another question, which is you could buy approximately blank times as many memory or as much memory in 2020 as in 2000 for the same money. Right? So then you have to read two values off the graph and divide or use some ratio information from that log axis scale. Um, and we'll see how much the accuracy of the answers that people give for these types of questions differs between the linear and the log scale. Um, and I'm, I'm trying to ask questions that are both reasonable for somebody to answer and um, that highlight both the advantages of a linear scale and the advantages of a log scale. Because I do think that there will be a difference. Um, we know that people have trouble with log scales just from watching people try to use them. Um, but we're looking for uh, data sets. So computer parts are great for that. But um, if anybody has any suggestions for excellent exponential data that's relatable to the common person and not to like an evolutionary biologist, um, <laughs> that I, I'm more than happy to hear your suggestions. Um, and then we're going to finalize and standardize that question language and run a couple of pilot studies to make sure that we've got everything right. Because um, that's going to be a really tricky process, I think, to get everything properly uh, set up. Once we've got that done and that pilot study run, we're planning to run one giant study, recruit like 200 participants from Prolific or Amazon Mechanical Turk or something. Um, and our goal is to hopefully match the demographics of the general population instead of relying on statisticians and people adjacent to statisticians. Um, like my family is totally sick of having to do these studies. Um, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so I don't think that they necessarily answer the questions like a member of the general population might having had to do so many of them. So we're hoping to have each participant take every one of the studies and so that that'll allow us to compare performance across study design and across participants. Um, and so we're hoping to start data collection for the big study sometime in fall 2021. Um, and that hopefully will allow Emily to uh, graduate uh, sometime over the summer <laughs> is the goal. So, um that's kind of what we're planning and hopefully i'll have you know great insights into how people actually work with log scales by the time the study is done um i think we've gotten very lucky in terms of being able to actually interpret some of the data from our pilot studies um but obviously most of those conclusions have this big asterisk of we recruited people on twitter and reddit and by email and through talks like this um, <laughs> And so um, generalizing to the population isn't really fair under those circumstances. So if anybody has any questions, I'm more than happy to take those now. So I have a question about the perception of log scales. Um, this past semester, I took a time series class mm -hmm. and we did a lot of predictions where basically for every single project we had to take the log to get meaningful um predictions but what when, when you say that people have trouble um understanding the log scale are you talking about like if someone said oh i just predicted log the number of carrots people buy or something like that is that what you mean um so what i mean is that if you tried to explain that to your mom um chances are most people are not familiar enough with how logarithms work um to actually be able to make sense out of what that translates to in real life which is why a lot of times when we fit log models we translate back to the original scale when we 
make predictions, when we right? Predict. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but when you have things on a log scale graphically, um, even if you label your axes correctly, the overall impression of like this is a line is misleading, right? right? And so there's there's certain things that you just can't translate back when you show things graphically. And that's kind of what I mean by people kind of suck at log scales is yeah. that it requires an actual understanding of the mathematics behind things that isn't, um, that requires a lot of cognitive processing that most people are not necessarily thinking of or activating. <laughs> um, right. Obviously statisticians hopefully are being a little bit more careful with how they interpret things, but uh, I don't think that that's necessarily a safe uh, assumption even with statisticians after all you know we do occasionally turn off the uh work brain and just read the news right <laughs> yeah so i guess like if if someone were to publish a paper or they're doing a project whatever um if they had to take the log scale it would be beneficial to maybe like step one show what like number of COVID cases as it is. And then maybe on the back end, do your log transformations and look at it yourself. And then when you present um, your predictive model, would it like, would you put it back? Like take the X. So that's, that's what we're trying to figure out, right? Is how much of a loss of comprehension and ability to actually make sense of things you experience by presenting data on the log scale. And that's something yeah. that we really don't know at this point. Uh, the one study I referenced um, uses a log log scale for the most part and is primarily focused on ecology type stuff where that type of scale is common. Right. Um, and I don't know that it generalizes all that well to COVID um, or to any other time series type plot where we have exponential effects. Um, so I'm really reluctant to say that we really know anything at all about log scales other than they do seem to require a lot more mental effort for us. Yeah, definitely. Um, and usually increased mental effort translates to decreased accuracy. But right. until you test that experimentally, it's just a suspicion, right? <laughs> so. That's kind of where I felt morally obligated to do the study. <laughs> Does anybody else have questions? <laughs>